Hi everyone, let's discuss aldehydes and ketones. So an aldehyde is one and a ketone, both contain what we call a carbonyl group. And a carbonyl group is this carbon that has a double bond to an oxygen molecule. And an aldehyde, the carbonyl carbon is attached to another carbon and also a hydrogen atom. In a ketone, that carbonyl group is bound between two carbon-based groups. So again, if we're just looking here in aldehyde, aldehyde here, we have our carbonyl carbon attached to a hydrogen. That's our aldehyde. And we'll also have another carbon-based group. Carbon-based groups are known as R. So R, this could be like a methyl group, an ethyl, any form of carbon. Now, in the case of a ketone, with a ketone here, that carbonyl carbon, that's our carbonyl carbon, is landlocked between two other carbon-based groups, okay? So aldehyde has a hydrogen, ketone is just between the two carbons themselves. So aldehyde, ketone. So aldehydes are great, will always occur at the end of a molecule, okay? So this is gonna make naming a little bit easier because they'll always be at carbon one. And a ketone can occur anywhere inside. So a ketone will never be on the end. It'll occur somewhere in the middle. So again, ketones are in the middle, aldehydes are on the ends. So if we're identifying these as either an aldehyde or a ketone, if we're looking at number one, technically that would be an aldehyde. So this is just condensing down. Um, instead of showing the double bond, it's condensing it further. So anytime you see a COH, well, realistically, that's the same way as drawing the first molecule like this. Okay, double bond OH. So this is technically A. And A, because it has this group here, this means it's an aldehyde. In the case of B, B, we have that CO in the middle. So with B, if we're redrawing B, CH3, CH2, C double bond O, CH2, CH2, CH3. This would be B. And that CO group here means that we're a ketone. So aldehyde, ketone. If we're looking at C, because C is coming between two other carbons, this is in the middle of the molecule, this is a ketone. And D, don't be fooled, D is at the end. So when D, when you see this little line here, and you see this double bond O, don't forget that this is a carbon, it's just showing carbons. That means there's another hydrogen attached to it. You're just not seeing it because we weren't showing those other hydrogens. If we draw them all out, they're there. So this technically, because it's at the end, is an aldehyde. So again, aldehyde, ketone, ketone, aldehyde. So when we name aldehydes, and then we're gonna go into naming ketones, Naming aldehydes are kind of fun and simple. We name the same way we've named everything else. We name that longest chain of carbons first, and we name it by the alkane name. So if we have a chain of four, that becomes butane. We drop the E and we add AL. So when we named alcohols, we added OL for alcohol. Now we're adding AL for aldehyde. So we would tend to um, make something butanal in this case. Now we number it the same way we would number everything else. We number so this way that the functional group, which is that C double bond O, that carboxyl group attached to hydrogen comes in carbon one. And then we name any of the prefixes that come off of that. So if we start naming A and then we'll name B don't don't get tripped up. We'll talk about this in a second. So A here, this would become carbon one. There's that C double bond O. So this is carbon one, two, three, 
four, five. It's five carbons long, so this becomes pentane. Because this is on the fourth carbon here, technically this is a four chloropentanal, A-L at the end. Okay, and we always assume this is carbon, coming at carbon one. If it helps you, you can always write it as a 4-chloro-1-pentanal. However, we assume that it's always a carbon-1 because it's always at the end. Now, when we see a compound that might have a cyclic structure, so I'm just going to give you a couple examples to do, and then we'll go over B. If I see this, and then I see a double bond O, um, and this would be an H, Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself going to the next one. Here, this is a cyclopentane. So we would drop the E and we add AL. This is a cyclopentanol, AL. If we see a hexane ring with a double bonded O and an H, this is cyclohexane. So we write cyclo, then you write hexane, drop the E and add AL. This is a cyclohexanol. Now this is always considered carbon one, always where this group is attached to. If I had a CL group down here, this now becomes a two chloro cyclohexanal. Anytime you see this structure and it has a benzene ring, so this is benzene, and we see benzene attached here to this. This becomes benzaldehyde. So B-E-N-Z-A-L-D-E-H-Y-D-E. -E -E. This is benzaldehyde. So remember when we're naming aromatic compounds, we name benzene as the main name. So we would drop the, in this case, E-N-E, -E, but because it's an aldehyde, we also write just benzaldehyde. It's one weird one. So when we have this cyclic compound, like again, the cyclopentanol, pentanal here. Remember, in this case, we just use cyclopentane, drop the E, add AL. Same if you just see a hexagon without a circle, this becomes cyclohexanal. Here, anytime you see a benzene ring attached to this, it's called benzaldehyde. This now becomes the base name that we'll use for anything attached to it. And this right here is carbon one. Okay, so if we're looking at B, B has this attachment, and then right above it is a CH2, CH3 group. We have an ethyl group. So now this becomes carbon 2, so this would be a 2-ethyl benzaldehyde. So again, anytime you see that benzene ring attached to that, that is considered benzaldehyde, and we use that as the base name. Um, aldehydes, especially ones that are aromatic, that have benzene rings, are considered flavorings, and so commonly are used as flavorings. The simplest one, which is benzaldehyde by itself, is actually the taste um, used for almonds. So if you had an almond flavor, it's actually benzaldehyde. Um, cinnamon is cinnamon aldehyde. Vanillin is actually an aldehyde as well. There it is. It's also a phenol, which is pretty cool. So if we get into ketones now, um, we kind of just name some brief aldehydes and we'll name a little bit more at the end. And we're going to name some ketones. Now, ketones are slightly different because that carbonyl carbon is coming in the sequence. It's no longer in the end. It's in the middle somewhere. So here we named the longest alkane name, just like we would do. 
we're going to drop the E and we're going to end it with O-N-E. So drop E, but add O-N-E. Now we're going to number that chain so that that carbonyl carbon comes at the lowest number possible. So we're going to number on the end closest to that carbonyl carbon. And then we'll name everything else. So it's very similar to alcohols in that sense. The naming stays the same. The big thing is, is we have to give that location of that, o, that carbonyl carbon, that C double bond, O bond. So here, I'm going to give you a hard one right off the bat. Let's focus on this. Our longest chain is this one, which is cyclopentane, okay, because it's five. Now, what we would do here is we would say cyclopentane, you drop the E, and you add O-N-E. So this becomes cyclopentanone. Now, what's neat, remember, anytime we name anything cyclic, we start numbering the carbon so that this is always on carbon one, the functional group. So this is a one cyclopentanone. And here we have a group. So this would be one, two, three. This would be a three ethyl one cyclopentanone. Okay. So we add our long name, our longest chain, which is cyclopentane, drop the E, add O and E. We start numbering because this is a cyclic compound, that carbonyl carbon can be carbon one. So we put the position in as a one cyclopentanone. And then we add any substituents groups. In this case, it's a three ethyl. Ketones that are commonly used that you might actually see, um, acetone is the simplest ketone you can actually make. Um, it's common in nail polish remover. It's also something that you make when you break down um, fats and lipids in your body, you actually make acetone. So let's just go over these and we're gonna classify them as an aldehyde or a ketone. And then we'll take some time in naming as well. So in this case here, you see a carbonyl carbon coming at carbon two. So this one in A is a ketone because it's in the middle. Technically we'd start numbering on the side closest to this. So this would become carbon one, two, three, four. This is a 2-butanone. If we look at B now, B has two carbons. This is technically ethane, drop the E. And because it's happening at the end of a line and it has a hydrogen, this is an aldehyde. So this becomes ethanal, E-T-H-A-N-A-L, ethanal, right there. And we don't need to note the position because it's always at position one. In this case, this is the hardest one probably for you. We see it's an, our carbonyl carbon is coming at the end. So this is an aldehyde. This becomes carbon one, always. We always count the aldehyde, the functional group itself is carbon one. So this is a one, two, three, four. This is a butanal. But on carbon three, we have two methyl groups. So this technically would be a three, comma three, so a three, three, dimethyl butanal. Here we go, if we're looking at D, notice how there's no circle in the center, okay? So this is not a benzene. This is just a cyclohexane with a double bonded O. It's coming between two carbons, so this becomes a ketone, and this is cyclohexanone. We don't have to put the one in because the one is always understood. So this is cyclohexanone and D is a ketone because it's coming in the middle of the sequence. So now I want you to classify these as either an aldehyde, a ketone, an alcohol, or an ether. And then we'll get over the names too because it's a really good review. A, if we're looking at A, this carbon is coming in the middle this is an ketone, okay? So a ketone here. Because it's four carbons long and we number on the end closest to this, the side of this double bond, this um, our carbonyl carbon here. One, two, three, four. This is a two butanone. B, we see the COC pattern. Anytime you see a COC, this is an ether. 
Remember when naming ethers, we named the shortest chain as an alkyl oxy, and then you use the longest chain as an alkane name. In this case, they're both the same. So this becomes a methoxymethane. That would be the name of B, methoxymethane. If we look at C, we have a carbonyl carbon attached to the end. So this is known as an aldehyde. So C is an aldehyde. If we're naming this one, the longest chain, one, two, three, four is four. This is that 3,3-dimethylbutanal, A-L. Here we have an OH group happening in the middle. This now is an alcohol. So OH means it's an alcohol. We name this off the longest chain and add OL. This is technically a 2-propanol. So let's name some of these compounds so we can kind of feel confident in what's happening. So if we're naming A, this is an aldehyde. So with A, we name off the longest chain, one, two, three, four, five. We name it pentane, drop the E, add a L. This is pentanal. Here, don't get caught up and lost. This is a CL, so don't forget that. Our longest chain is one, two, three. This is a propanol, propanal, P-R-O-P-A-N-A-L. This is carbon one. Always remember this is carbon one. So this is a three chloropropanal. And that last one for you is right there. So let's do these. Um, we're going to go over A, B, and C. Again, A. Here, these are, this is a ketone, okay? The ketone here is occurring on this end, so we're going to start numbering from this carbon here closest to it. This is one, two, three, four, five. So this becomes pentanone. It's occurring at carbon two, so it is a two pentanone. In B, you have a cyclohexane. This becomes cyclohexanone, and this is occurring at carbon one. Here is an aldehyde. If we're looking at our longest chain, one, two, three, four. We've done this one a couple times now. This may actually come back on the exam because we've talked about this about five times. This again is our 3,3-dimethylbutanal. So there are those names for you. So let's get into drawing. So you want to be able to name them. You also want to be able to draw them. So let's focus on a 4-methyl pentanal. So the first thing you're going to do is take the name apart. Pent means five carbons. Because we don't see cyclo, we're going to add them just in a single chain. One, two, three three, four, five, okay? Now that means the next thing you do to do is just number them. One, two, three, four, five, just so you have a rough idea. Anytime you have an aldehyde, that means carbon one, whether you deem it to be on the right or the left, is going to be the aldehyde. So here, this is gonna be my aldehyde, so I'm gonna put my double bond O, and an H, okay? That's the AL of the name. It's occurring on carbon one. Four methyl means at carbon four, I have a methyl group, a CH3. So now I have everything done in my name. I have the four methyl, pent meaning five, AL meaning this is occurring on carbon one. So now you just have to make sure carbon makes four bonds. So I'm missing two, so this becomes a CH2 here. This is a CH2. Here I have three bonds. This becomes CH, and on the end is a CH3. So that would be the first one, that would be A. If we're looking at drawing B, a 2,3-dichloropropanal. So prop means three carbons. So one, two, three. 
propanal, and remember here, I'm just gonna label it, and I'm gonna do it on this side to be a little different to show you. This will be carbon one, two, and three. So on this end, because this is carbon one, this is where I'm gonna put my aldehyde, double bond O and an H. There I made my, al my aldehyde. Now a 2,3 dichloro means at position two and at position three, I have a chlorine atom, CLCL. -CL. Because dichloro means that there are two chlorines and they're located at position two and position three. So now they're in. So my whole name is in already. All I have to do is make sure carbon has four bonds total and I'm gonna use up those remaining bonds with hydrogen. So here I have two bonds. So this becomes technically a CH2. Here I have three, so this is a CH. And this one, one, two, three, four, we don't touch, okay? So this would be a two, three dichloropropanal. And the last one to draw is a three methyl two butanone. So butanone means butane is four. So let's draw our four carbons. One, two, three, four. I'm now gonna number them. One, two, three, and four. A two butanone means that carbon two is our double bond. So I'm gonna put in the double bonded O. Okay, a three methyl means at carbon three, I have a methyl group. So that's a CH3. Now the whole name is done. All you have to do now is make sure that carbon has four bonds. So in the end, I only have one, so I need a CH3. Here, I leave it alone. I have one, two, three, four. You don't add anything to that carbonyl carbon. Here, one, two, three. So this needs a hydrogen. And here I need three hydrogens. So again, if we were to look at it, we see our CH3, C double bond O, CH, here's that methyl group CH3, CH3. And that would be our three methyl two butanone. So feel comfortable taking those names apart and drawing those molecules so take your time, number them, and go through. What's good to know is that those carbonyl carbons have a little bit of polarity with them. So they provide some what we call dipole-dipole interactions. So because we can have these partially positive, partially negative charges, we can have an increase um, in a little bit of bonding. And we can be polar to some extent, so we can be soluble to some extent as well. So our boiling points, because that dipole interactions is going to be a little higher and elevated, so they'll be higher than alkanes and ethers. However, because they are not fully and aren't, we aren't able to do hydrogen bonds, they're actually lower than alcohols. So it's just kind of putting you in um, perspective of the boiling points. It shows you bond strength. So, but I want you to know about solubility. Again, along the lines of alcohols, it's the same. Anything with one to four carbons is soluble in water. Five and above are not very soluble. You'll only have the little part of it, wherever that carbonyl carbon is will be soluble. Everything else becomes insoluble at that point. So one through four soluble, and then five and above, um, slightly soluble or not soluble. So let's talk about these. Um, A. Remember, this is just propane, all single bonds. So this is not soluble in water. B is technically ethanol. OH has two carbons. This is soluble in water. This is an aldehyde with one, two, three, four carbons. Don't forget to count this carbon in, okay? So this is butanal. And that, because it's one through four, is soluble. And our last one, again, is a ketone, and it's in the middle of two carbons. So here, one, two, three, this is a two propanone. This is soluble because it's less than five, okay? 
Now, it is important to understand about oxidation. So let's talk about what we can do for reactions. With alcohols, we can oxidize and dehydrate them. In aldehydes and ketones, we're gonna talk about oxidation and reduction. Those are the main things they're gonna undergo. So alcohols are easily oxidized to an aldehyde or a ketone. Remember, a primary alcohol oxidizes to an aldehyde and a secondary alcohol oxidizes to a ketone. Now aldehydes, we can oxidize one step further because they have this available associated hydrogen. We need a hydrogen attached to this carbonyl carbon to be able to oxidize. Because we have it, we can form what we call a carboxylic acid. Now ketones, on the other hand, do not have an available hydrogen. Remember, they're landlocked between two carbons. Therefore, they cannot be oxidized. Ketones are like tertiary alcohols. They cannot oxidize. So I would like you to know this sequence. You should know that a primary alcohol oxidizes to an aldehyde and an aldehyde oxidizes to a carboxylic acid. On the other hand, a secondary alcohol oxidizes to a ketone and a ketone cannot oxidize. So it stops there, that's the end of the line. And a tertiary alcohol cannot oxidize at all. So primary to aldehydes, aldehydes to carboxylic acids, secondary to ketones, ketones cannot oxidize any further, that's the end of the line, and tertiary alcohols do not react. Okay. So one way we can distinguish between an aldehyde and a ketone in a mixture is to use Tollin's test. Now in Tollin's test, we use Tollin's reagent, which contains silver. And what's neat is it'll oxidize aldehydes, but not ketones. So if you have an unknown solution and you want to know if it was an aldehyde or a ketone, we could add in a little bit of Tollin's reagent. Um, we add in Tollin's, and if it is an aldehyde, you'll actually, the silver will come out of solution it'll oxidize and you'll have a mirror in the test tube. So, um, which is actually pretty cool. So again, Tollin's test helps us to distinguish between an aldehyde and a ketone and it will oxidize um, aldehydes, but it will also not oxidize alkyls or ethers. It's a very distinguishable test. Now we have another test we can use, which is Benedict's. Benedict's is a great test to help us predict, um, we call reducing sugars, and we'll talk about that later, but we have copper, and it will react when we have an aldehyde that has what we call adjacent OH groups. So they have to have um, almost like it's a combination of an aldehyde and an alcohol together. We see these in our sugars. A lot of our sugars, like glucose, will actually have this set up. So we're gonna get into carbohydrates and Benedict's test is a great one in testing carbohydrates. So if it has an aldehyde in this OH group, it will oxidize and that blue copper color now becomes this brick red color. Benedict's test has been used and has actually um, been modified to become almost these little quick urine tests and they test and can be used to determine if there's the presence of glucose in the blood or urine. So it's used as a urine uh, dipstick. You've probably done that in a &P if you ever did the urinalysis. Um, we'll actually go over it when we start talking about carbohydrate tests next week in a little lab component. But Benedict's itself, if there is um, any form of glucose here, which has the aldehyde and an adjacent OH group, will turn to a brick red color um, if there is glucose present. So. Now, because we know that an aldehyde can oxidize and a ketone cannot, remember the opposite of oxidation is reduction. So aldehydes and ketones can actually both go under reduction. And in reduction, what I'm doing is we're actually adding in hydrogen and we're breaking that double bond. So we're gonna pop a hydrogen on either end. So we can think of the bond splitting apart, 
one H going to the O and the other H going to this bond here. So it becomes, and the reduction breaks those aldehydes and ketones back down to their alcohols. So any aldehyde, when it is reduced, forms a primary alcohol and a ketone that is reduced forms a secondary alcohol. So it's just undoing the oxidation. So in this case, because I have a aldehyde, I am going to form a primary alcohol. So when I add the hydrogens in, so here I have my CH3, it went to a CH2, CH2, and then we have our C double bond O and H. This bond here is what's breaking. It's going to split apart and open up. One hydrogen goes here, another hydrogen goes there. So it's just think of that bond that's connected like this, opening up, and we pop on a hydrogen to either end. So we form that primary alcohol. So we're forming the primary alcohol. In this case, we formed a one, one, two, three, four, one butanol. In the case of B, so B is our ketone. We have our cyclohexanone. When this splits up, this bond is going to open up here. So this now becomes an OH and an H. So this just becomes cyclohexanol. So you're basically just taking the ending and you're changing it to an OL, putting it in its alcohol form. So reduction is just going backwards. It's the opposite of oxidation. What's important to know is that aldehydes and ketones are commonly present throughout your body. And we'll get into it when we actually start discussing um, lipids and carbohydrates, and we'll get back to these functional groups. So carbohydrates like sugar, starches, and even cellulose have either a aldehyde or a ketone component. They're either what we call aldoses or ketoses. Now steroid hormones, a lot of them are actually ketones. So progesterone, testosterone, cortisone, even aldosterone, because they end in O-N-E, are ketones. Their name actually reflects the functional group that's in them. So a lot of our hormones are ketones. We also have um, aldehydes in our body, like retinol. So retinol, A-L, is actually an aldehyde. When it mixes with the protein opsin, it forms rhodopsin, and that's the main component in vision. And again, when we have that light exposure, when we were talking about cis trans the other day, this is where it comes back. It's that cis trans isomerization going back and forth, and that geometry change between cis and trans that sends that nerve impulse that allows you to see. And then a synthetic version of a ketone that you've probably heard about is methadone, um, which is used when we have some addiction cases. One of the classic things um, that you've probably already learned and talked about in patho, and we discussed slightly when we were getting into acids and bases, is a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, this is an acidosis condition, meaning that your blood pH lowers. So it gets lower than 7.4. Um, Remember, it's getting lower. Now, in this case, um, this usually happens just with, this only happens with diabetics, hence the name diabetic ketoacidosis. Because they're either lacking in or resistant to insulin, energy usually comes down from breaking down fatty acids. When you break down fatty acids, you build up ketones. Ketones are the byproduct of metabolism of fatty acids. And we'll get back into this when we discuss the metabolism. Um, it's also a byproduct of when you break down proteins. Because of this, uh, diabetics have a much greater chance in a concentration of ketones in their bodies and bloodstreams. And therefore, they can get into what we call a ketosis state. And that's when we build up ketones and ketosis can lead to acidosis. 
So if a diabetic is under or subjected to some form of stress, whether it be illness, emotional trauma, even disruption to insulin treatment or surgery, particularly surgery, um, also when a diabetic is even given steroids, like prednisone is another one. When that happens, a diabetic um, usually produces hormones such as adrenaline to any of these cases, okay? And when adrenaline is being used or even prednisone, it increases the rate of fatty acid metabolism. So it causes those ketones in the body to accumulate and acetone builds up. So it starts down breaking down um, that and it builds up acetone. And that is what's actually going to cause your blood pH to drop. So diabetic ketoacidosis is a metabolic acidosis condition. Now, symptoms of this include dehydration. You'll have deficiencies in salts like potassium. Um, you'll have some nausea, fatigue, confusion, usually cramping, excessive thirst, decreased perspirations, and obviously treatment can obviously involve um, reducing any form of stress and insulin therapy to try to help. The other neat thing that I wanna talk about when we discuss aldehydes is that aldehydes are used in commercial cleaners. Um, some of them actually still use formaldehyde, others like glutaldehyde. And the way aldehydes work is that they can kill bacteria and fungi and viruses and some more microbes, and they kill them by dehydration. So what's neat is when an aldehyde comes in the presence of an alcohol, uh, not an alcohol, but um, a little bacteria, what's going to happen is we're going to remove water. It's going to oxidize the aldehyde and form a carboxylic acid. So it's a two for one in this sense, which is great. So it'll actually remove the water and what it needs from the bacteria. And the bacterium needs water to survive. So it's going to dehydrate it in that sense and disrupt it. But it's also going to create, because it forms now carboxylic acid, an acid-like condition, um, which is another thing that will help not, will kill it and help it not survive. So aldehydes are commonly used as disinfectants. So that's what I have on this. Um, if you have any questions whatsoever, please let me know. I'm gonna put up some practice problems and um, just give them a try. So feel comfortable with naming and drawing, know what they oxidize to form, know what they reduce to form, know any of the um, important features that are, are related to medicine and health, okay? And if you have any questions, again, let me know.